Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutteth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Thursday, the 6th day of July 2017. In the Atlantic Basin, we have Tropical Depression 4, which formed from 94L out here in the deep tropics in the open central Atlantic between Africa and the Lesser Antilles. A vigorous tropical wave in the monsoon trough out there finally gave way to this system and it's moving generally off to the west-northwest at, yeah, not too bad, about 21 miles per hour. It's picked up some. Remember, it was barely moving. Now it's you know, kind of hauling the mail a little bit. Air pressure down to 1,008 millibars. Top winds 30 miles per hour. Looking at the track over the next few days, it should make it the remnant low of it, that is, into the southwest Atlantic. And we will certainly keep an eye on it. It's not going to just go away into nothingness, into oblivion, there will be a trackable feature to watch over the next few days. But the good news is, in terms of any impacts to land, there will be none. But nevertheless, we'll keep an eye on it to see what happens in the future. A wide satellite perspective this afternoon, you can see a very vigorous circulation with the system. It's fairly small in size. It's not a very large amplitude system. It doesn't cover a lot of real estate. But you can see even in this visible animation that the dry air, the stratocumulus clouds are encroaching. And anytime these thunderstorm clusters go up, they're going to ingest that dry air, pulling it into the developing core, if you will, where the low pressure center is. And then those thunderstorms deflate almost as fast as they go up. So for you folks here in the Eastern Caribbean, you are always on the front line of these systems as they come off and they head west. Are they going to go north of you or right through your area when they do so? Well, in this case, this system, as I showed you, should track to the north. And there's just a few other areas of clouds moving in. But this tropical system will be the dominant player uh, over the main development region here of the Atlantic Basin over the next few days. And then the Saharan air layer will kind of take over. So the bottom line is you guys down there in the islands from Trinidad and Tobago to Barbados, all the way up through St. Lucia and Guadeloupe, U.S., British, Virgin Islands, etc. Man, a beautiful time coming up. Overall, just a few scattered showers here and there uh, in the Eastern Caribbean. A close-up satellite image uh, put into motion. It really does have a vigorous circulation here, especially at the mid-levels. You can clearly see that rotation if it weren't for the dry air, and you can really see that coming in here, no convection to speak of in some of these bands that are trying to wrap energy in there, and that dry air just does a number in the mid-levels. Um, you need a lot of moisture and latent heat in the atmosphere because of that warm, moist atmosphere, and it's just not there because of this dry air coming in, being ejected off of Africa. And that's very typical, though, of July, so not a surprise at all. Uh, but you know what? If it wasn't there, this would be well on its way to becoming a hurricane over the warmer-than-normal waters of the main development region. And you can see there's pretty decent feathering of the clouds here. Uh, some people call these eyelashes or whatever. Um, so, you know, it, it had a shot, and it made it to tropical depression strength. Might have been a weak tropical storm at some point, but it's really academic. It doesn't necessarily matter. What matters to me, and we go back to the wide shot, and the thing that I take away from this is we have another tropical cyclone between Africa and the Lesser Antilles in early July on the heels of not too many weeks after a uh, bona fide tropical storm, uh, which of course was Brett that moved in through here, also originating from an African easterly wave, a tropical wave. So there you go. That's the a sign, if I ever saw it, of a busy season ahead. The vorticity signature, of course, it looks nice and round uh, for the most part because it is bundling the energy. You know, it's got a lot of ingredients there, but the one thing lacking is the moisture, and this is the responsible party for that. The Saharan air layer really starting to get close to it now. And it's interesting, a lot has been made of this. Lots and lots of tweets about it that I've seen. Dry air is going to kill the system. Dry air, dry air, dry air. Well, first of all, this is very typical in July. And even in 2005, the year of the hurricane, and you know that year, we live in such a fast-paced society. I know everybody remembers it, but that was a substantial 
Um, that's one of the biggest events in all of American history in terms of hurricanes go. Uh, and, and certainly the impacts. We had four major hurricanes hit that year. And even then, on August the 15th, I think it was, somewhere around there, I'm going to find the image. Uh, there was a pretty big Saharan air outbreak off of Africa that year. And, you know, none of the big hurricanes that hit the United States developed in the main development region that year. Katrina didn't. Dennis did not. Rita certainly didn't. And neither did Wilma. And so, you know, sometimes this is made out to be more than it should. And even if we look at the analysis, there are a few little pinks way up here, maybe some over here. And this is a substantial sal outbreak. But it's not like it's all over on the right-hand side where we just have this massive area of so much dust that is going to block out the sun a little bit and cool the ocean temperatures. And you know, we'll see. I'll show you uh, Monday and then next Thursday how this it did or did not change the sea surface temperature profile. Sometimes those dust outbreaks will do that. You know, you think about it. It's almost like a haze in the atmosphere, and it does reflect a little bit of sunlight. So anyway, the Saharan air layer uh, in our favor this time because it's going to ingest. The, 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 basically, the sow is going to catch up, and the whole thing is acting like a big plow, bulldozing this along. It's going to steamroll it, and that'll be the end of it in terms of a major threat. In the eastern Pacific, this really continues to um, you know, get my interest, pique my interest, as they say. You know, Very good chance this is going to develop, yes, but... So what? It's going to die out over this colder water uh, that we've been talking about. And I'll show you the update today. All of this area through here is just full of this anomalously cool water. And we can look at that right here. And the very latest is updated just a little while ago. And there it is. I mean, look out there in the eastern Pacific, off of California, down across the Baja. Uh, we're talking 20 degrees north latitude, which is right here. And all of this water north of there, the East Pacific, off the Baja, running fairly substantially below the long-term average. So anything that's developing out this way, we're going to have to see development down here. And you know, even if it turns northwest and heads towards this cooler water, because remember, above that cooler water is a more stable air mass as well. So it's not just the cooler water by itself, it's what the cooler water does to the atmosphere above it. And that being said, look at what's happening here in the eastern third of the Pacific here. You know, we have a pretty good band of these cold anomalies showing up. They're not substantial. We're not heading towards a La Nina, that's for sure. Uh, we just don't have the pressure pattern out here to support that, you know, with really strong trades ripping through. We don't have that, but it is absolutely, I mean, right in the wheelhouse of neutral. You know, we don't see any warm anomalies through here of any substantial nature. And if you kind of averaged everything together, we're just a little bit on the positive side of neutral. And you converse that, you know, contrast that with the Atlantic uh, and how warm this is relative to average, then we have the makings of a very busy season uh, for sure. Uh, and you can almost say that for sure. Now, where they're going to hit, who knows? We'll have to wait and see about that. And notice, too, Gulf of Mexico, shrinking area of cold anomalies. The Gulf is warming back up. I told you that it would, and it doesn't take a genius to figure that out as long as there's nothing in the Gulf to stir things up. The microwave in the sky that we call the sun does its work, and all that energy gets stored. And if we look at a wider perspective, you can really see how the Atlantic is really the dominant feature in terms of the warm pool on the globe right now. This area is warmer relative to average than pretty much any area except the extreme West Pacific over here. And even there, the lack of typhoons this year is astounding. And I remember, I think it was March or April, that the Euro hurricane or tropical cyclone forecast was starting to come out for the year ahead, and it was suggesting well above normal activity for the Western Pacific below normal activity for the East Pacific and the Atlantic. And so far, it's been fairly wrong. We've had little typhoon activity at all. In fact, I don't think we've had any typhoons yet. And the Atlantic Basin is you know, almost on par with what's been going on in the East Pacific. You know, there was one short-lived hurricane, but it's just interesting how, you know, how quickly things can change, even just 60 days later. 
All right, so again, the golf warming up post Cindy. Uh, if you're going down to the Mississippi Sound over here, let's use yellow, that'll show it better. Water temperatures 29 degrees Celsius. There's some 30 Celsius showing up here along southeast Louisiana. Um, and this is shelf water, I get it. It's shallower, so it's easier to warm up. Uh, but boy, if you're going to go to Cedar Key right here, Whew, 31 degrees Celsius water temperatures. That's getting it, boy. That is that's warm. All right, that's like, you know, what's the difference between the the air temperature and the water temperature at that point? Not much cooling effect to the old body if you jump in. I, I just can't imagine. I'll take my 81, 82 up here in eastern North Carolina. But the point is, the Gulf is right where it needs to be in terms of supporting intense hurricanes. And with the forecast coming out yesterday of increased activity, uh, we really do need to be vigilant this year. I know they say it only takes one, but what if it's more than one? You know, we want to be uh, ready for that. It could be a very active season uh, for land impacts, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere. So here you go, the Gulf warming right back up. And I want to point this out. I went through the 17 pages of Dr. Klotzbach's latest update he and his team uh, put this out yesterday and scrolling through different aspects of it and this is what I think struck me the most uh, that the June 1st through 30th basically the month of June wind shear anomalies were below average in the main development region and this paragraph right here just kind of like I don't know, it kind of set it off for me right here, that the latest forecast from the CFS model, that's the climate forecast system, is calling for slightly below normal vertical wind shear across the main development region and portions of the Caribbean during the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season from August through October. If this forecast verifies, we could potentially see a much more active main development region than what has been observed over the past few years. And you say, well, how accurate is this forecast from the CFS? And that's not shown here. Or maybe it is. Let me scroll down. It might be. Is it? Yes, there it is. Uh, Levi Cowan at tropicaltidbits.com able to put this together, and he had it included. So this is the forecast for the August through October time frame. And you can see through here, lower than average vertical wind shear. And when you look at the Caribbean especially, you think, well, anything that develops out here has a shot at recurving out into no man's land. Fine. Uh, we can all understand that. You know, it, the steering mechanisms for systems that develop out here usually favor recurvature. Well, obviously, because if they didn't, nobody would live along the U.S. East Coast. It would just be unbearable. Most of the hurricanes turn out to sea. But well, I'm going to tell you something. When you see this in here and you look at the, you know, where this is in regards to land, you have to say, yikes, that could be a big problem. That if we have below normal wind shear through here, combined with these tropical waves that will come in, not all of them will develop. Um, these are all going to be closer to home and in other people's homes, Jamaica, Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Central America, and, of course, the United States. So I don't know. You know, this is, this is it. you got to really take this time to say, all right, I haven't really done much over the last few years. Hurricanes have kind of been... Uh, you know, out of the status quo, and I'm going to pay a little bit more attention now. Just something. Uh, even me, you know, uh, I try to do a little things here and there for the family, get some extra water every week. You know, the things that are going to make your life a little bit better after a hurricane. Getting through the hurricane itself is pretty common sense. You leave if you're told to do so, and if you're going to hunker down because you're not going to flood from surge, you got to be prepared to sustain yourself for you know a week to 10 days and that takes effort you can't just do it at the last minute and run to walmart or publix or harris teeter or wherever it may be and think you're going to stock up on stuff your blood pressure goes up it becomes stressful it's stressful enough for me to get ready to just go on a field mission you know i know what it's all about i go into these areas and i see it every single time and i want you guys that are listening to this and watching these videos to not be part of that crowd and look at this, don't let it panic you, but let it motivate you. Let it motivate you. Like you went to the doctor and he said, look, you got to get into shape. I see some warning signs of this, that, or the other. You have time, do some things, get your health back in order, 
And that's a good analogy, too, because I've actually been doing some of that myself. Uh, a little less carbs here and there, et cetera, et cetera. But the analogy applies. It's a warning, a sign, take action, do something, all right? Have a great rest of your Thursday. At least we don't have to worry about anything imminently. And we'll probably have plenty of time for that later. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thanks for tuning in. I do appreciate your time and attention. And I'll be back with more for you tomorrow afternoon.